Welcome to today's program on invasive everything, really. Attack of the Invasives, new species to have on your radar. So we have Ellen Crocker here from the University of Kentucky. Ellen is an assistant professor with the Forest Health Extension Program. She has a PhD in plant pathology and plant microbiology from Cornell University, a BA in biology and history from Williams College. Her extension responsibilities are tree and forest health, invasive plants, insect pests and pathogens of trees, mushrooms, and then she has research interest in forest health and sustainable forest management, forest pathology, invasive plant biology and management, as well as plant soil feedbacks. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ellen. Uh, Wonderful. She, she, she can probably tell more about herself. Oh, no, that's great. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks for inviting me to talk with you all today to join. Um, so I'm always happy to talk about invasives, um, although, you know, it's, it's a little uh, um, disheartening to talk about them as well, because there are so many different invasives, right? There are so many different species. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it can feel overwhelming at times. So today we're going to talk about some of those different invasive species, as well as kind of uh, to introduce this, what makes something invasive in terms of, you know, how do we define what's invasive or not? And then I'm going to go through three different classes of invasives for today's talk. You know, um, uh, Chris mentioned that my background is in forest uh, health. So I'm thinking particularly, and today the examples I'm going to give are invasives that can impact our forests and natural areas, whether that's insects and diseases that can kill trees or plants that can take over these natural spaces. But you know, they're invasive animals, they're invasive fish, they're invasive um, uh, uh, mollusks and everything else. So um, just kind of the tip of the invasive iceberg. And then just a few tips and hopefully some discussion about uh, what we can do about those invasives. So how do we define invasive species? I think this is important to start with because invasive is something that's used um, casually in our conversation. You know, something's invading my yard or something um, is invasive if it has the ability to colonize rapidly and kind of um, take over quickly. But the federal definition of an invasive species is a little bit more specific and it has these two components. Um, in particular, something that's not native to the ecosystem you're talking about. So it's from some other part of the world. Um, typically our invasive species will come from Asia or come from Europe. Um, you know, if some are very, very distant from here, they wouldn't naturally be here if we hadn't have moved them one way or another. And that is important because they haven't really evolved with the plants, with the animals, with the system that we have here. So they're gonna have different interactions with those. And then that, the introduction of this organism uh, causes economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So basically, they're not from here and they're bad. That's the um, formal definition of an invasive species. And you know, that's set uh, by the federal government and every different state will come up with its own lists of, let's say, invasive plants um, based typically on uh, some different calculations that they use to determine, you know, how is it impacting the environment? How is it likely to negatively impact other things? But I'd also say that most invasive species also tend to have this feature that they can spread rapidly and take over. Um, so we don't really care about them if there's just a couple and they stay put, um, but many invasive species can just take over. Um, being part of the reason why they're such a big problem. So we care about them because they cause harm, right? They cause ecological and economic impacts. What does that mean for the species that I'm talking about today? Um, they can directly or indirectly impact the native plant communities and the native species that we care about. This could be, you know, directly impacting them, maybe changing the soil in some way that hurts them or indirectly just out competing them, taking the space that they would normally have and thriving there. Um, and in a lot of cases, these are things that are decreasing biodiversity. So they're decreasing the diversity of different native species that we wanna see. 
And that diversity is important just because it's great to have those species, but it's also important because having a diversity of species gives us a buffer um, to changes. And we know that there's a lot of changes happening right now. And we want to have a diversity of different species. We also want to have a diversity of different species. Let's say plants. We want to have a diversity of different trees um, because we like those trees, of course. But because that diversity of trees is also going to support a diversity of insects. That's going to support a diversity of animals from there. Um, so that diversity is really key. And if these invasive species are negatively impacting that, whether it's killing particular species for the insects and pathogens, or growing in these dense stands that's going to prevent a diversity of native species, it's a problem. And then many of these can actually change systems to their benefit. So not only are they there, not only are they causing problems, but they're fundamentally changing those systems that'll impact things long term. Um, so a couple other points on terminology. Um, I, I want to emphasize this because I think this comes up a lot. Uh, not native does not inherently mean bad. There are plenty of non-native uh, plants in this case that we really like, right? Whether they're agricultural crops, things that we eat, uh, like apples, whether they are trees that might be valued in the landscape setting like ginkgo. Um, most non-native things aren't invasive and they won't become a problem. Um, they might, you know, if you think about the gardening in your landscape setting, there's a real value in doing that with natives because they support our native um, uh, insect and animal communities as well. But not native does not inherently mean bad, and native does not inherently mean desirable. So there are lots of uh, great native species that are fantastic. Here's a great one. Here's my gardening tip, right? You plant this native species. No, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to plant this native species, even though it has great fall color, a beautiful fall color, a great red color. Um, uh, it's great for wildlife. But um, if anybody who doesn't recognize the species, this is poison ivy. Poison ivy is native. So uh, it might take over and you might not want it for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly because it can make you really itchy, um, but it's a native species. And similarly, grapevine, um, a, a lot of times in a woodland setting, this will be considered a negative, um, especially if it's interfering with the small trees growing into the big trees you want to see in the future. It can grow on top of them and kind of cover them. So locally, it might be a problem and you might, you know, remove them because it's not doing what you want. Um, so it might not be desirable, but it's probably not going to take over that whole area um, in the same way that some of our invasives can. Um, and so similarly, native does not mean they won't take over. We have many native species that are very effective early colonizers. You know, that's what they do. They're going to be one of the first things to show up in an old field site. So one of the most common things that I hear this about is um, a cedar, eastern red cedar. Um, people say, oh, it's invading. It's an invasive species. And it does invade. It invades old field sites. It's one of the first things to do so. Um, but that's kind of its role. That's what it does. It's, uh, you know, an early successional species that'll come in right when something's transitioning out of that, that field uh, setting into more of a forested one. You might want to manage it for different reasons. You might want to remove it if you want to see other species thriving there. Um, uh, but it's not invasive in that federal definition because it's native here. And there are lots of other species that you know, they might take over and uh, you might not want them in your yard necessarily. So this is river cane, which is a great species, a native uh, bamboo, um, but it will take over in some areas. Uh, similarly with sumac, I love sumac. I would love to have some sumac in my yard, but I have a very small yard and I don't want it to completely take over. And um, this is spice bush, which I love and I use um, all the time in my gardening. Uh, but in the woodland setting, sometimes it can grow so densely that um, foresters will recommend managing it just to release some of the tree seedlings that are there and let them grow up through. So just because something's native does not mean it's um, perfect and just because it's non-native doesn't mean it's terrible. But these invasive species that I'm talking about today, they're non-native and they're having these really big negative impacts in our environment. Um, so I know, you know, from the chat that you're familiar with many different invasive species. Um, I, I saw mentions of honeysuckle and winter creeper, a couple other invasive species. If I'm thinking kind of broadly, I'm sure you're familiar with emerald ash borer. Let me know in the chat. Are you familiar with the emerald ash borer? <laughs> the emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle that's been decimating our ash trees and killing them. 
Um, and that's been happening for some time. I think it was first detected in 2009 in the state. Uh, so much of the state, this is these trees are dead and they've been dead for some time, um, but it's still moving into the western part of the state, so it hasn't completely moved throughout Kentucky yet. Um, another invasive issue that we're really grappling with um, is hemlock woolly adelgid, and I've got a picture there of the hemlock, and you can see these little white kind of fluffy cottony things on them um, that are made by these uh, insects. They're sucking insects and they will um, really stress hemlock trees. These are all invasives that are really fundamentally changing things in our area. And we could talk this entire hour about these four, but you know, the name of today's talk was new invasives. So new things that you should have on your radar um, so today I'm going to just talk about a small subset of newer invasive uh, pathogens that cause tree diseases, insects that will cause damage to trees, and invasive plants to uh, kind of raise awareness of those. Some of them we have in the state already, and I want to tell you about them because they're likely to be spreading in the future, and so help you identify them and hopefully try to slow their spread. And some of them we don't have in the state, but you might have heard about, and I just wanted to talk about those briefly. So it's not going to be all encompassing. We're just going to scratch the surface on some of these, but hopefully getting you thinking about, you know, we have these invasives, but what are the next invasives that are going to come in and be a problem? So first I want to talk about some invasive pathogens. And right now we're all very familiar with invasive pathogens. You know, we're, we've been dealing with one particular invasive pathogen for the past year, uh, you know, COVID-19 and um, an invasive virus that's been impacting humans. But I'm going to talk about some invasive pathogens that impact plants and trees in particular. Um, so historically, uh, I know that probably you're familiar with chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease, and I know that there was a, a great talk recently on chestnut blight, um, but these are two pathogens. Um, chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease are both fungi that have just you know, fundamentally changed things in our natural areas because chestnut blight has eliminated chestnut, which used to be very important in large parts of the state. American chestnut, and then Dutch elm disease uh, killing elms. And uh, I like this old historical photo you can see. Now this is elm. Elm was, now chestnut was very, very important in our forest settings and people and wildlife ate the nuts. Um, but elm was very important in our urban areas and in our landscape settings. Elm was an excellent landscape tree. It had this beautiful form. Um, and so this is kind of a before and after photo of a street. Um, before Dutch elm disease and then after, um, killing all of those trees and, uh, you know, just really changing things. So those are two historical pathogens um, that we still deal with today and are still a problem today, but have had a big impact in the past. I'm going to tell you about a few others um, uh, that are one that's already here and two others that are kind of nearby and in our area to put on your radar. So the first I wanna tell you about is laurel wilt disease. Um, so this is a new disease for us, although it's been in North America for some time. Um, here you can see a map of where laurel wilt is and you can kind of see it here all along the coast. It's been there, I think initially detected in 2002. Um, and then you can see that there's been this big jump over into our area just in the past couple of years. Now in this area, it's uh, on Red Bay Laurel, uh, thus the name Laurel Wilt. Um, it's a different uh, species than we have in this area. We don't have Red Bay Laurel, but we do have two species that are in the same family, Sassafras and Spicebush. Both of them can be killed by this disease. Um, and uh, this first kind of um, move into our area is all on sassafras, although unfortunately I have also seen spicebush um, killed by this disease as well. Um, so a little bit of background on laurel wilt disease. It is caused by a fungus, but that fungus is being carried from tree to tree by these tiny little ambrosia beetles. Both the fungus and the ambrosia beetles are not native to here, they're native to Asia, um, where there they wouldn't cause, they wouldn't be attracted to healthy trees, they wouldn't cause this kind of damage. Um, here, unfortunately, in our area, they're attracted, the beetles are attracted to healthy trees, and once the fungus gets in, even one introduction of that fungus can kill that tree. 
Uh, so it gets in the vascular system and clogs things up, um, stops the flow of water in that tree, and will kill it pretty rapidly. Um, so both of these are uh, native to Asia, and but I, I don't think our particular outbreak came from Asia. I would imagine that like so many different um, things that impact trees, insects, and diseases, um, this probably came from someone accidentally, unintentionally moving contaminated material from further south. So perhaps moving some firewood, um, you know, we won't really know for sure, but that would be a great way to move it from over in this part of its range to where we are. So what do you look for with laurel wilt disease? On sassafras, uh, it's pretty distinctive in the summertime because when the trees should be green and healthy, um, you'll see early fall leaf color. So sassafras, I love sassafras. It's a fantastic tree. It's got this beautiful fall leaf color, um, but you could see that earlier in the year. Um, and then maybe a lot of dead sassafras as well as this um, leaf color and wilting of the leaves, laurel wilt. Um, and that wilting is coming from the fact that you've got a vascular, you've got fungus in the vascular system of the tree. And the vascular system of the tree is what it needs to move around water and nutrients and other important things. Um, so if it's clogging things up and the tree's also clogging things up as it tries to defend itself, um, that's gonna cut off the water. So what you're actually seeing here is water stress. It looks like falls come early, but it's that tree that's struggling for water. And just a heads up, you know, we've had um, laurel wilt reported and uh, confirmed in Jefferson County, as well as all through this area. So I have a feeling even though right now, we only have a limited number of counties that have um, tested positive for laurel wilt, um, in the coming years, we'll have many more because unfortunately, I think we're probably a little behind the curve on this and laurel wilt is likely in more places than we realize. Um, so another way that you would confirm if it's laurel wilt is that you could um, cut away the bark of that tree. And again, this is destructive, so you wouldn't want to do this to a healthy tree. Um, but if your tree is already dying or dead and it's got those symptoms cutting away the bark, and what you'll see underneath is this very streaky black staining in the vascular system. And that's the fungus that's in there that's clogging things up. So on this tree, you can see it really well. And this is kind of a cross section of a smaller twig. Now, what you can see is just under the bark there in this outermost or maybe outer two rings on some um, plants I've seen, you'll see this, this dark staining there. Um, now, there are other things that can cause that kind of staining. So you'd still want to take it to your county extension office and they'll send it to our plant diagnostic lab to confirm that. Um, but uh, this, this dark streaky staining to me is, is pretty indicative of laurel wilt. Um, so another thing you might see are uh, signs of these tiny little red band ambrosia beetles, the invasive insect that's spreading this around. Um, but I'm going to tell you they are tiny. <laughs> They're easy to miss. Um, here's the size of these holes and this is my finger. Uh, so you can imagine that if you were not looking very carefully for this, you would miss it. Um, similarly, some of the, this insect will also create these tiny toothpicks of frass that'll stick out of the tree. They're very small and they're easy to miss. Um, so I'd say um, to be on the lookout for sassafras that's in decline. Um, a couple other points about this before I move on though, is that um, despite the name laurel wilt, this is not going to impact um, mountain laurel. It's not in the same family. And in Kentucky, I really think it's going to be restricted to spicebush and sassafras, unless you've got any other plants from, from that group uh, that aren't native here, uh, but um, maybe you're trying to grow from further south. Um, it's not going to have the biggest impact in our not natural areas because Sassafras is really only about 1% of the trees in the state, but I think it kind of continues the trend of Dutch elm disease, of chestnut blight, of the emerald ash borer in removing that diversity that's so key in our natural areas. Um, so despite the fact that it might not be as big economically, it's still very important ecologically. And uh, unfortunately, right now, there's really no treatment for this. Uh, there is some work to try to figure out if we can use a fungicide to protect individual high um, value trees. Um, but because only one beetle is needed to move the fungus into a tree and cause the death of that tree, 
it's going to be really hard to control. So I think the most key thing with laurel wilt, and this is true for a lot of different insects and diseases that impact um, our trees, is not to move contaminated material around, you know, not to move firewood. Um, I've heard people moving this around because they're wood turners and the streaking is really beautiful. Um, but being careful of that because that's a really effective way to move around um, this disease. So another disease I want to briefly mention is beech leaf disease. Um, so this is another new issue. Um, fortunately, this is not in Kentucky yet, but is pretty close by uh, just to our north in Ohio. Uh, so I wanna put it on your radar in case you happen to see something that looks like this. So this is a new disease of American beech that is believed to be connected to a foliar nematode. Um, that's native to Japan. So this is a new discovery. And for a long time, people were trying to figure out what is causing this, uh, what is causing the symptoms and this decline of uh, beach. And um, what they're finding is this, this foliar nematode, um, a tiny little roundworm that's um, in the leaves and also overwinters in the buds uh, that hadn't previously been detected here is, is always associated with this. So trying to better, I know researchers are trying to better figure out that relationship. Um, because the distribution of beech leaf disease is very patchy across the landscape and even on a single tree. But symptoms would include things like this, this banding of light and dark colors on leaves. Uh, it's, it, other things can cause some similar types of symptoms, but um, pretty distinctive, as well as some shriveled, um, discolored or deformed leaves uh, clustered near the tips of branches. And uh, over time, decline and death of trees. And this is especially true for understory trees, for saplings, for those smaller trees. While it can impact larger trees, what they're finding is that this is mostly for those smaller understory trees. So this was first observed in Ohio in 2012. And over the next few years, uh, they kind of found this association with that nematode. And it's a very new thing. So they're still trying to figure out what's going on. But here you can see a map of where it's currently been uh, reported or confirmed. Um, so you can see why I'm sharing this with you today in that you know, since 2012, it's already moved um, a lot and um, I think is a potential issue for us as well. Now they're still trying to figure out exactly how it's moving and how it's being spread, um, but it could certainly be spread by shipping around um, a nursery stock that had this, um, potentially some other things as well. Uh, so something to be on the lookout for and to be thinking about. Um, the last thing we need is another thing that's impacting uh, beach, um, which is an important part of a lot of our native um, systems and forests. Uh, so there's one other thing that I wanted to mention to you uh, disease-wise, and that's sudden oak death. And I put it in my talk because I get so many questions about sudden oak death, and I'll get a lot of um, emails, uh, people saying that they think they have sudden oak death or that a tree died of sudden oak death. And um, this is a good news case in that we don't have sudden oak death. We don't have sudden oak death in Kentucky. It has not been uh, confirmed here. And, um, you know, there's lots of other things that can kill your oak trees, however. So you might have had a sudden oak death, but you don't necessarily have this invasive pathogen that causes sudden oak death. Um, so sudden oak death is caused by a pathogen, Phytophthora remorum, and on the west coast it has killed millions of oaks and tan oaks over the past 20 years. Um, you can see here in this picture there's a forested area and all of the dead trees in there were killed by sudden oak death. Um, and despite the name sudden oak death, it's not as sudden as, as it implies. It actually takes several years to kill that tree, but the visual impact of it is very sudden. So the tree might look like it's perfectly healthy and then dies really suddenly, but it's actually been there for a longer period of time killing the tree kind of um, under the bark and behind the scenes. So sudden oak death is a, a tricky, tricky disease um, because it's caused by this invasive pathogen that infects many different host plants. And depending on the host plant it's on, people might call it something different. So it's called sudden oak death when it's on, um, on oaks, but when it's on other things, people might call it remorum blight. And it might not look like much. So 
these are two other hosts that this one pathogen can cause disease on. And, uh, you know, on this one, uh, bay laurel in California, it just causes a few little leaf leaf spots, nothing much, just some dead little tips. It looks like nothing and you probably wouldn't think twice about it. But this is driving that disease there. This oak, um, there are oaks there, the coast live oaks are actually a dead end host. And so what's really driving things are these other hosts that are um, it's able to really reproduce on. So a bit of a tricky, tricky thing to control because on a lot of different plants, it doesn't look like much. And a lot of the plants that it can be on are very popular nursery plants. Um, so again, the, the pathogen that causes sudden oak death makes different types of symptoms on different hosts. On most, just little leaf problems. And it's got a huge wide host range. So everything from some conifers to broad leaves and in between, it might not look like much. It can infect it. It can cause a little disease, but not really too bad. Um, versus on oaks and a few other species, it can get into the trunk and cause cankers that can be lethal. So growing in that trunk, destroying that tissue and killing the tree because it's cut off that circulation of um, water that way. Um, so, so that's tricky and it's tricky to control because here's where it is right now kind of on the west coast. That's where sudden oak death is established in natural settings. And it's thought to be native to somewhere in Asia, although it really hasn't been confirmed where it's native to. We just know it's not from here, but it's also a problem in other parts of the world. It's a, an invasive issue in Europe as well. Um, so it's established on the West Coast, but we have, this is a risk map of, you know, where, where is there trees that are at risk to sudden oak death? And you can see that there is a lot of area that's at high risk in the eastern United States. So what people are really concerned about um, is that it will move from the western U.S. to the eastern U.S. where there's ample suitable hosts, the environment is conducive to it, and um, this could definitely happen because in large part nursery trade. A lot of the species that it can survive on but not cause many symptoms on are popular nursery plants. And sure enough, it has been shipped multiple times um, accidentally uh, from the Western US to the Eastern US um, through nursery trade. So this was a couple of years ago. Um, there was a confirmed case where a nursery had been accidentally shipping plants that were contaminated with sudden oak death throughout the Midwest. Um, so there were lots and lots of news headlines about this. You might have read some, you know, sudden oak death disease detected in plants from Walmart. Um, Illinois warns of sudden oak death after finding infected plants. And there was kind of this major concern about that. But um, I would say, I would urge you to kind of go more towards this headline and that sudden oak death pathogen found, but don't panic yet. Because, um, you know, just because it was being shipped around in the nursery trade, there's no indication that it spread into the landscape. And they, they did detect that and try to track down those plants that had been shipped um, and remove them. Um, it's always possible and it's really important to be on the lookout for these things. But to the best of our knowledge, it's not here yet. To the best of our knowledge, none of those plants were shipped to Kentucky. And um, if you have an oak tree that dies suddenly, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't help you that we don't have sudden oak death. Your tree still died. But this is one pathogen that we don't currently have, but it's important to kind of be on the lookout for. Um, so with that, I want to kind of transition over to some invasive insects to look out for. So currently in Kentucky, we have major epidemics of the emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid. Emerald ash borer impacting all of our native ash trees, as well as white fringe tree, with white and green ash being particularly impacted. Blue ash has some resistance to this. It's better able to defend itself um, from the emerald ash borer, but white and green ash are being um, you know, killed off in large numbers. Uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is impacting hemlock trees. And uh, these are insects that are native to Asia and were accidentally introduced here and are causing big problems. So, you know, again, the emerald ash borer uh, is, is a problem for ash and its larvae tunnel just under the bark of trees, causing a really compromised vascular system, killing that tree. Uh, and has resulted in many, many dead ash trees um, in our urban landscapes and in our woods. 
And um, I'm happy to talk more about Emerald Ash Borer if you all would like or have particular questions. But today's talk is about new invasive insects to have on your radar. So I want to talk about a few um, that aren't in Kentucky yet, but have the potential to move towards our area for you to be aware of. So the first one I want to talk about is the spotted lanternfly. And here is a picture of the spotted lanternfly, um, an invasive insect uh, that, that has potential to really hurt our trees and woody plants. Um, and you can see it's kind of beautiful, right? If we, if we didn't know that it caused problems, if it wasn't an issue, you'd see that and be like, wow, look at this beautiful insect. Although if you're like me and you like insects, you might think that um, if an insect can be beautiful. And it's got um, spots and it's uh, a, a, a true bug. It's got sucking mouth parts, even though you'll see some photos of it and it kind of looks like a moth with its wings spread out. It's not really that, it's not a moth. Um, and what it does is it will suck the sap from plants, from trees, uh, from uh, woody vines and shrubs. Um, and the reason it's a problem is that it is gregarious and prolific. So there are so, so many of these spotted lantern flies that will cover plants and will suck sap from them and uh, have the potential to really stress trees over time. Um, so unlike the emerald ash borer, where those larvae are tunneling and directly damaging those trees, uh, the spotted lantern fly can really stress trees over time just due to its sheer numbers. Um, and then it also poses a problem just for some other reasons that are associated with having so many insects everywhere. Um, so this is it on its favorite host. And you'll notice this looks really different from that picture I just showed you, right? This is uh, the nymph of it, which is also beautiful and eye-catching and spotted, but looks very radically different from that adult. But here it is on its favorite host. And I don't know if anyone recognizes this. If you do, feel free to put it in the chat and um, you'll get bragging rights if you've guessed it. Um, but uh, this is something that if it were to stay on this host and eat nothing else, I would be delighted to have it here because this is something that I don't want in this area. Yes, Susan, it is tree of heaven. Um, so an invasive plant. Uh, and again, you know, it doesn't stay there. That's not the only uh, plant that it will be on. It does really like tree of heaven, but it can also uh, be a problem on all sorts of other trees. Whether we're talking um, these broadleaf deciduous trees like maple and oak, and poplar and sycamore and you know others, um, conifer trees. So already you know it's got a broad host range if it's on tree of heaven and pine trees. <laughs> um, and where it's really thought to be a problem is going to be in fruit trees as well as in grapes and in hops where you have these orchards that have a really concentrated number of host plants um, as well as the fact that if you get all of these um, insects in your grapes, that's going to be a, a big problem for uh, uh, your vineyard, you know, uh, for, from a different perspective. Um, so let me show you some other pictures of what it looks like at different points in its life, because it's one of those insects that I think looks really different depending on where it is, but it's also pretty eye-catching. So if you see it, this is something that you could report to someone, and it's possible to at least locally eradicate it and try to try to slow the spread of this organism to our area to buy us more time. I mean, it'll probably get here over time, but the longer we have until it arrives, um, that's great because not only does that buy us time to kind of deal with better management of it, try to figure out how we can control it better, but also time in which it's acquiring and accumulating its own predators that'll hopefully keep its population in check over time. So here are its eggs. And unfortunately, uh, the females will cover them with this waxy substance that makes them really hard to see. And she'll lay eggs on just about everything. So you can see here some eggs on a barrel. I've seen photos of um, eggs being laid on cars. Uh, so if you're in an area that has spotted lanternfly, you wanna be really careful that you're not accidentally moving this out. And uh, I know I've presented on this in the past and I've had people speak with me who work for um, trucking companies. 
um, who have told me like, yeah, we're looking for this and we're looking for this on our vehicles because we know if we're passing through area with spotted lantern fly that it could be potentially spread, which to me is really exciting and encouraging. And I just wanna give them kudos for looking for that. Um, so those eggs hatch and they hatch into little nymphs. And here's kind of uh, initially, they're gonna look this black and white polka dotted kind of nymph. Um, and you can see already there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them that are that are gathering. And this is Tree of Heaven again. Um, and then as they grow, they're going to change and become more of this red and white polka dotted uh, nymphs. Um, many, many of them, right? So this, and you're getting the picture with spotted lanternfly, why it's a problem. And then into the adult. And while they might have this you know, distinctive form if their wings are all pushed out by some entomologist that wants to take a pretty picture, um, more likely they're going to have their wings closed and kind of be coating the limbs of these trees, sucking sap. And this is why they're a problem. It's not that there's one or two of them, it's that there's thousands of them just coating everything, sucking the sap from things. Um, and uh, as they do that, they'll excrete this honeydew, this sugary, sugary uh, substance that will get sooty mold on it and turn everything kind of a black color as well. So something else to look out for. So where is spotted lanternfly right now? Um, the most recent map I could find of spotted lanternfly shows, you know, those counties that are in blue, this dark blue is where it's located. Um, so there's a, a major pocket here in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware area. Um, and then also more recently, some moves into West Virginia, Virginia, um, and the Virginia one, I saw the first report of Spotted Lanternfly in Virginia on iNaturalist, which is an app that I hope many of you use. It's an ID app on your phone, um, but I think it kind of speaks to the power of if you see something, you know, you can report it on iNaturalist, but even better, if you can contact your county extension agent, um, you can st start that moving more rapidly and really try to think um, and, and help them do something about that. Uh, so a map of where it currently is not in our area yet, but it's only one introduction away. It's only one person accidentally moving it from this area uh, to our area that could cause major issues, um, which is scary because that could easily happen accidentally. So another insect that I want to mention, because it is even closer to us, is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, here you can see the insect itself. Um, it's, it's quite large, uh, which on the one hand means that it can be very destructive because its larvae tunnel in trees. And um, while it has a pretty broad range of trees that it can tunnel in, it, it really likes maples. Um, I've talked about, you know, things that have impacted chestnut, things that have impacted elm, things that have impacted ash and hemlock and sassafras, and now maples. Um, so you can just see how these invasive species are really chipping away at the great diversity that is, you know, our native plant species. Um, so this, this insect really likes maples and its larvae will tunnel through the tree and it's so large that it can really compromise things. You can see here, this is uh, the size of one of those tunnels is about the size of a dime. So imagine your maple tree riddled with tunnels that big. Um, you know, it might look something like this and be really compromised on the inside. And you might think to yourself, oh, there'd be no way that you could miss that. And, um, you know, these insects are pretty large. They kind of stand out. But it's actually surprisingly easy to not notice these things until they've become pretty advanced. Um, there was recently a new outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle in South Carolina um, and near kind of the Charleston area. And unfortunately, I think it's been there for quite some time and just no one noticed, or if they did notice, they didn't say anything about it. Um, so now it's gonna be a lot of work to try to contain that and stop it from spreading further. So um, here's a tree that, that has this damage, um, but it's pretty far along and you might not notice it until things um, get, get worse. So this is a map of susceptibility potential to the Asian longhorn beetle um, accidentally introduced many times from Asia on contamin contaminated packaging material. Um, and you can see 
I mean, we have a lot of maple, right? There's a lot of susceptible hosts and susceptible areas to the Asian longhorn beetle, and it has been introduced repeatedly. Um, now, each of these introductions is, uh, most of them are probably coming directly from Asia on material that hasn't been treated properly and still has uh, that insect in it. Um, but the exciting news is that this, this insect doesn't really fly too far. With the uh, emerald ash borer, you can't really contain it because it's moving rapidly, there's ash all over the landscape, and it flies um, pretty far, and so it's going to move really quickly. With the Asian longhorn beetle, every time it's detected, the USDA sends in a task force to try to contain it. So they are finding and scouting um, all of the susceptible hosts in the area, trying to find those that have this insect, um, cutting and chipping them to kill it, uh, finding nearby other hosts that might have it but, but don't show those signs, and getting rid of those as well just to be safe. Um, they are treating trees with insecticides. They are scouting. They are doing all sorts of things to try to stop this insect and prevent it from spreading into our forested areas. And in my mind, it's a real success story because they've been able to eradicate it many times. So all of these green areas um, here, uh, Boston and the Chicago area and uh, New York, they've been successful, complete eradications of the Asian longhorn beetle, um, which is amazing. And so, you know, we have a little pocket of it right here in Southern Ohio, and they've successfully eradicated it from a couple townships, but there's still a pocket of active Asian longhorn beetle infestation there. And, um, you know, it's really exciting that there's something you can do to control it, to stop it, and to eradicate it. I'm not going to downplay that this is a real negative for the areas where it's found. Um, from the Ohio one, they have surveyed millions of trees in just this tiny area um, uh, of, of that has Asian longhorn beetle. And of those, they found over 20,000 infested trees that they removed. But they also removed oh, ne nearly 100,000 high-risk hosts that were still healthy in that area. But, you know, they looked healthy, but they might have had the beetle in there. You can't really tell until it gets a little older. Um, and this is kind of a 60 square mile area. So you can imagine that um, those living in that area, you know, they're paying the price for, for other folks so that it doesn't spread out. And, you know, thanks to them for doing that. Um, but it, it sure does stink to have your trees cut down because of that. But the sooner you can catch something, the, the, the faster you can stop it. And I think the Asian longhorn beetle is one of those where they have successfully eradicated it a number of times. So inspires some hope in me. Um, so uh, we could talk more about any of these, but I want to move on to invasive plants because there are so many different invasive plants out there um, from invasive trees like the tree of heaven, like princess tree or polonia, like mimosa, like calorie pear. We have seen tons of calorie pear this spring. Um, it is popping up everywhere and I'm sure you are as well. Um, to invasive shrubs like multiflora rose and privet and burning bush and bush honeysuckle, oh, too much bush honeysuckle, um, a major issue in our area because all of these invasive shrubs, shrubs are kind of clogging up um, old field sites, they're clogging up understories of forests, and they're preventing the little saplings from growing into big trees because they're shaded over and they're crowded out. They're preventing the diversity of native species that you wanna see there, whether they're your beautiful spring wildflowers or just other things. You can't get those if you have a dense stand of bush honeysuckle instead. And it grows so densely that you don't really see things underneath it. And areas with a lot of bush honeysuckle have higher erosion potentials because of them. And then there's invasive vines. Um, kudzu is really well known, but we've got lots of them. Um, uh, uh, Oriental bittersweet was mentioned earlier. There's porcelain berry, there's Japanese honeysuckle. Um, there is winter creeper. And the reason why they can be a problem is uh, they can sometimes carpet the ground like this winter creeper is doing here. And you might see a little something trying to pop up through there. But it's really hard for plants, whether they're seedlings or um, wildflowers, to get through this dense blanket of winter creeper. But they can also grow up trees. They can overtop trees, prevent their access to light 
and kind of smother them over time. Um, some of them can actually, like oriental bittersweet, can actually damage the trees that they're growing on as well. So a number of reasons why invasive vines can be a problem. And then there's lots of invasive grasses and herbaceous plants. And the list of invasive plants is really long, um, but really the reason they're a problem is not just that they're existing and that they're not native, it's that they're taking over and they are preventing other native species from establishing and from being successful and growing in those sites as well. And what you get instead is a sea of these invasives. Um, and you know, there's there's no one silver bullet to any of these, and they have different management that's going to match the biology of each of these invasive plants and your site and what you've got to deal with. Um, but I want to mention a couple invasive plants that I've seen really increasing in our area in the recent past to put them on your radar if they're not already. Um, they should be because they're likely to pop up in a yard or in a natural area near you. And the earlier you can catch those things, the sooner you can kind of work to stop them from being established. It's a lot more work to try to eradicate, let's say, bush honeysuckle when you've got this dense stand of it. And then it is if you're just pulling up a couple of plants and you have to do that regularly. There's always going to be, you know, more invasives coming in. But if you can kind of promote the health of your native plants and um, use native plants and prevent those invasives from establishing, it's a lot easier than trying to kind of clear the slate once they're all there. Um, so a couple that I want to mention is Japanese chat flower is the first one. And this is something that's really increasing in our area. As you can see here, uh, this is kind of a, a photo of what it might look like in the summertime, a very dense stand of it. And you can see it's right next to the water, right next to a river. And indeed, that's how it's been spreading is along the Ohio River. This is a map of where it's been reported in our state, Japanese chafflower, um, first found in North America in 1981 and has since kind of spread along the Ohio River. Um, but it can spread out from there. So it doesn't just stay along the river. It'll spread into other sites, into uplands, into roadsides, into all sorts of settings, into under forest, under stories, um, you name it. So what does it look like? This is what it looks like a little bit later in the season. And you can see it's got this big spike. Um, that spike is uh, uh, its flowers that then turns into seeds will form these large spikes later in the year. Um, but when it starts out, it's going to kind of be, this is the flower, not very noteworthy. It might look similar to some other things you've seen in this area in that it's got these opposite leaves, kind of red at the inner node, um, smooth margins that are just a little wavy, and this, this branching or uh, venation pattern on the leaves that's, that's somewhat distinctive, although we do have other things that look somewhat similar. And then these flowers are in this little spike that's going to extend and elongate as it grows. So here you can see it's elongating um, and those petals um, in that inflorescence and they produce many, many, many seeds. And each of those seeds has this little stiff hair on it that will let it stick really well to your clothes, to fur, um, so animals could move this. You can accidentally move this uh, really easily because it'll just get, get embedded. Um, so something that's very easily, easily accidentally spread, as well as likely spreading along waterways naturally. Um, so it's inconspicuous, it spreads very easily, and it forms these really dense stands um, that'll invade areas of this perennial herbaceous plant. Uh, another invasive plant that I want you to be aware of if you're not already, and it sounds like many of you already are, is lesser celandine or fig buttercup. Here's a photo of it in flower, and you can see why people like it and why they might initially see it and be like, wow, that's so beautiful. I love it. Um, it's got these beautiful yellow shiny um, flowers, and I have seen people who have planted their entire yards, or maybe they planted one and it spread out to their entire yard um, with lesser celandine. Um, I read a report that its, its introduction to the city of Cleveland was started by two individuals 
planting this in their yard because it looked so pretty. And then it spread out to cover hundreds of acres really rapidly from there. Um, and, and not only does it not stay put, and not only does it you know, just blanket areas where it's growing. So here's kind of an area where you can see it's just a dense, dense stand for that lesser celandine. Um, in this case, not really in flower, but you can see those leaves kind of carpeting everything. Um, it's a spring ephemeral. So uh, this could be in February um, or March with the leaves and then it will flower. It's just flowering right now and has been for about the past two weeks. Um, these, these bright yellow flowers that come and then they go, and then it goes dormant for the rest of the season. So um, not only is it not a great choice for, for garden settings because of that, uh, because it's going to take over your yard and then go dormant and the whole thing will look terrible, um, but it will rapidly colonize outside of the yard setting into, it really likes kind of streamside and riparian areas, but we'll move into all sorts of other sites from there too. Um, and so here's a photo of the leaves. You can see they have this kind of heart-shaped, really glossy, um, dark green with this little watermarked um, color on top. And then these are some of the flowers, these bright yellow um, buttercup flowers, very attractive, but the flowers are really there very briefly. And by the time the flowers are blooming, it's a little bit late for um, managing with herbicides. You really wanna hit them before the flowers start. Um, and they are very hard to pull up. I said herbicide because they're difficult to pull and to dig up because under the ground, what you're not seeing is that they have lots and lots of bulbs, these tiny little bulbs that if you try to pull them up, will dislodge and they'll stay in the ground and just form more of it. So if you are pulling it up, you really wanna be careful to get all of it um, to dig it up instead of just trying to pull it out. Um, or you could, if you don't want to use herbicides, you could cover it with a tarp for several seasons, and that's another option there. Um, but definitely, if you've got that in your yard, you want to get rid of it um, and prevent it from establishing. So with all of this, it's really easy to feel discouraged and kind of feel like, what can you do to stop invasives, right? How could you, <laughs> you know, what, what could it, we possibly do? But there's a lot you can do. And I'd say that the most important thing you can do, the biggest impact that you can have is to prevent their arrival to begin with. Um, so this is a graph that I like that's more of a conceptual graph that shows time and then area infested and control costs. So the, the basic concept being that um, you want to be controlling things early because the longer they're here, the more of them that there is, the harder it is to control them. So if you can catch something before it spreads um, across the landscape, like the Asian longhorn beetle, you could actually eradicate it. But too frequently, we don't really know about these things until they're already widespread. So you're not going to be able to eradicate some of these plants, but you certainly can locally control them. And the sooner you get to it, the easier it is. So this applies with insects and diseases too, though, in that, you know, do not moving firewood is really important for stopping the spread of them or contaminated material in general. I saw we had a question about mulch, and it really depends on how that mulch is treated. Um, if you, mulch is being commercially made, it's going to get very hot in that process, and that would kill things in there. But if that's not happening, then you could easily accidentally move something around. Um, and that applies to plants too when you go site to site. You know, cleaning off your boots, cleaning off your tools. If you're a boater, cleaning your boat really well um, and not kind of moving things from site to site. Uh, um, not releasing things in different areas that could cause problems. Um, and then another thing that I point out to you all is to plant native and non-invasive plants. So um, I uh, work with the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council and they have a fantastic resource, Kentucky's Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants that you can find on their website that goes through a lot of the invasive plants and some great native alternatives. So I really encourage everyone to think about that from a number of different perspectives. Um, you'll be happier with those species, the insects will be happier, um, uh, the other plants you know, in your area will be happier. So instead of people planting 
Tink Bradford pair, which they're probably going to be unhappy with for a number of reasons. Um, you know, picking some of the great native alternatives that are out there or non invasive non natives. Um, so you've got your surface berries and your um, dogwoods that are just, you know, beautiful. And the same with some others, whether you're talking about burning bush and our great native alternatives like aronia or Carolina buckthorn or uh, English ivy, another invasive vine problem. And some great kind of ground covers like wild ginger or maybe a beautiful uh, native vine like our native honeysuckle. And then if you see something suspicious, if you're seeing a lot of dead trees or a, a new plant you've never seen before completely taking over, uh, report it, tell someone. And I, I included this picture because the um, Asian longhorn beetle outbreak in Ohio was detected by someone. Oh, uh, buckthorn is invasive. There are invasive buckthorns, but Carolina buckthorn is a native buckthorn. Let me clarify that. I saw someone in the, the comment. Um, there are invasive buckthorns as well that you don't want to use. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Ohio outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle was detected by, by someone who saw the trees dying and reported it early. And so it's really important if you see something like that, if you see one of the things that I talked about today, one of the insects, um, you know, report that to someone. Uh, because the sooner they can, they can find it, the more options there are in that toolbox for dealing with it. Um, so if you've got invasive species locally, there are removal options, especially for your plants, and then uh, options for protecting individual trees for insects and diseases, uh, and containing and mitigating some of those options long-term uh, in sites. Uh, so one of the hardest things is knowing which invasives are a problem and which it's always going to change in the future because new things are going to come in. But it's a good idea to get familiar with the most common invasives in your area. And a note that I wanted to put in here is that just because they're not invasive in your garden doesn't mean they can't still be invasive in natural areas. Something like honeysuckle that, um, you know, it's been around since the 1800s and only more recently has it started causing problems moving from that landscape um, ornamental role into the role in natural systems. Um, so unfortunately, it's really hard to predict what's going to become invasive in the future, um, and then you're kind of left uh, dealing with it. Um, there's great expertise available to help you in local invasive plant councils, native plant societies, county agent conservation districts, and more. So if you have questions, reach out to someone um, with those. Uh, so there's a really wide range of useful resources as well for you online, in addition to those individuals or these organizations. The Forest Service has lots of great books for free on invasive plant management, on um, identification, and then I really recommend some of the new technology that you can use, things like iNaturalist um, for identification and EdMaps for reporting um, that we could talk more about. But I know that our time is pretty much at an end, and um, I appreciate you joining today and learning a little bit about invasive species and wish you the best of luck in uh, dealing with your invasives, but also promoting the health of your native plants. Um, and that's really what it's all about. It's not uh, in my mind as much as about uh, fighting the invasive. Sometimes you do have to, but it's about having those vigorous native plant communities that are gonna thrive into the future. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions. And also, um, if you, you know, want to hear more about these, learn more about those, point you to uh, my labs group on uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube at KY Forest Health. And you can get updates on new invasive um, uh, issues as they arise. Thank you so much, Ellen. It was fantastic as we knew it would be. So, <laughs> so yeah, if you all have questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. We'll stay on here as long as we uh, get questions. So uh, feel free to ask questions for Ellen. And I think I got to the ones that came up while I was talking, but if I missed it, feel free to put it in the chat again. What about oak wilt? Oak wilt is really interesting. So oak wilt is um, a disease that's caused by a fungus. 
Um, and as with some of the other wilts that I mentioned, uh, what it's doing is that it's clogging up the vascular system of the tree and cutting off the flow of water. And you're seeing these wilt symptoms and this death um, over time due to that. Um, but I'll say something about oak wilt. Now, when I first arrived in Kentucky, I was um, kind of trying to establish, you know, what's the problem in our area? What are the major insects and diseases that could impact oak? Because oak is such an essential species in landscapes, in the forests from an economic perspective you know, oak is really important. So oak wilt stood out to me. And um, I did some research on this and you can find maps of where oak wilt is in the country. And you'll see it's, it's all over Kentucky, right? Well, uh, I, I looked around for oak wilt and I, I didn't find it and I'd never seen it. Um, and then I, I approached our plant diagnostic labs in the state and they have never had reports of oak wilt. Um, it's never been confirmed to say the map that exists, it's kind of a mystery in terms of why it's all over Kentucky. We, we've never had positives, um, at least in the past 20 years to our plant diagnostic labs. Um, I've never seen it. If you have seen it, I would love to um, know more about it. <laughs> I want, I want your sample. Let me know if you have it. Um, but uh, really where oak wilt is a problem is areas, it's, it's particularly problematic on red oak in the uh, upper Midwest. And where you have dense stands of the same species that are kind of all next to each other because oak wilt, it can be spread by insects, but it can also spread naturally through root grafts in those trees. So where oak wilt has been a problem is um, where you've had some major event like a drought that stressed trees and then oak wilt has kind of been the nail in the coffin. It's moved in on those stressed trees and killed them and if you've got a high density of the same species um, it can move tree to tree to tree. Here in our area, we're fortunate in that we have pretty healthy oaks. <laughs> you know, we like to grow oaks in this area. We've got good conditions for oaks, but we also have a diversity of species. We have oaks, we have many different oak species. We have red oaks, we have white oaks, we have others um, that I think, you know, and I come back to this diversity. It's all about diversity. Diversity is our biggest um, forest health prescription, our biggest buffer for the future because it, something couldn't really move tree to tree to tree in that same way. And so I would not be surprised at all if we had oak wilt here. It's not really clear where it's native to, although it's, it's at least somewhat believed to be native to, to North America. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we had oak wilt here, um, if it were to pop up, especially as trees are dealing with the impacts of the drought we had a couple of years ago. Um, but I haven't seen it yet. It's really not driving things in this area. It, if it's there, it's not causing widespread death of trees. Um, so, so hopefully that addresses your, your oak wilt question. Um, uh, I've seen, I see a question we have about a cultivar of crab tree blooming in wooded areas. Um, I haven't noticed any increases in this. If anyone, Chris, have you noticed this or do you have any comments on that? I've seen a few of them around from here and there. I've not noticed them to the point that they're forming a big colony. But I do see them occasionally seeding around. Um, and I think really our audience today is kind of all over, all over the Ohio Valley. I'm not, not sure if they're like um, farther away. I, I think some people registered from as far away as several states away. Oh, uh, wonderful. So I'm well, not sure great to from. have you all joining. And you know what? The things that I mentioned, um, I'm thinking about for this area. And in your area, if you're joining us with us um, from somewhere further away, you might have different issues that are most important in your area. or you know, you might have species that are becoming problematic where you are that are different from ours um, because climate plays a really important role in that too. Um, so if you're joining us from somewhere else, I'd really encourage you to, to reach out to your county extension office or any of those great local resources to try to, you know, get a grasp of, of what's the major issues or what's changing in your area because that's going to vary place to place. We didn't talk too much about, you know, how do we define invasive plants and how is that list set? But that's a really interesting thing as you move from state to state, because, you know, with 
um, you know, warmer conditions further south and colder conditions further north, you can get something that might be more of a problem um, in one area and less likely to be a problem in another area. So really important to have that local expertise and knowledge. Oh, I see someone saying from Texas that their oak, their, their oak wilt killed their live oak. And I'm sorry about that. I've seen uh, I, the symptoms on, on live oak leaves are really different from what they look like here um, in, in the, the, the pattern of that kind of veination of the necrosis on the leaves. Um, here in, in Kentucky and in central Kentucky especially, um, it, we have something that looks very similar to oak wilt. Uh, it will look the same, it will act the same, it will kill trees and that's bacterial leaf scorch. Um, bacterial leaf scorch is a major issue in our landscape settings. Um, and it will kind of do the same thing in that it clogs up the vascular system of trees, but it's the symptoms of it. What you notice, even though the problem is happening in the vascular system, the symptom that you see is in the canopy and it's in wilty leaves and it's in the scorch from the edges in on those leaves. Um, on, on red oak, uh, oak wilt would look very similar to bacterial leaf scorch. Um, but we unfortunately have tons of bacterial leaf scorch and there's not much you can do about it. Um, once it starts to become a problem in a tree, it's gonna be a slow progression to death over time. Now I would say that um, bacterial leaf scorch, it's not gonna happen overnight. And that if you can promote the health of your trees that have bacterial leaf scorch, you can really extend their lives. Um, so, so maybe that, to our oak wilt question, that could be an easy thing to confuse with bacterial, with um, oak wilt. Um, hi from the Netherlands, hello, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to have you joining us. Yeah, I didn't know we had international audience. That's always, that's always the, the best thing about these Zoom meetings is it, it, someone can be anywhere. And that's, that's what's so great about it. And some of the things that I talked about today are also problematic in the Netherlands um, or, you know, in, all over the world and different parts of um, the world. I mentioned sudden oak death. It has issues in Europe and in the nursery trade in Europe as well as in North America. Um, but, uh, oh, you used to live there. Now you're in Indiana. That's okay. But um, one question I get all the time is, you know, why do we get all these invasive species from Asia? And like, what, you know, like, why... Like, why do we get them? Um, and the answer I would have is that they get our species and Europe gets our species and, and their species that you might not think twice about here become invasive and become problems, um, which is I think the flip side to that in that really it's just about all of this global trade. And um, there's no kind of like one, this, it's not like it's just species coming here and being a problem. Um, for example, our black cherry, which is a totally normal native species um, here in North America that we love um, and has great, I love cherry wood, it's one of my favorites, um, is invasive in different parts of Europe. And uh, what they found, and I think this is something we could talk more about too, is that um, here, uh, soil pathogens will kind of prevent it from growing really densely. Like seedlings, if they're too close to their parent tree or they're too close to each other, there's greater disease on those seedlings that kind of kills them off and prevents them from being super dense. Whereas those same things don't necessarily happen in other parts of the world. Um, it can grow, it can proliferate and grow really densely um, and become more of a problem. And that's true for other species as well. Um, every, across the globe, people are dealing with invasive species, um, uh, unfortunately. Uh, do we have time to talk about the ash borer now? Sure, sure, let's talk about the emerald ash borer. Um, if you have particular questions on it, you can let me know. And um, I can see if I have, yes, I do. Why don't I share uh, a map of where the emerald ash borer is right now? Um, so let's see. In our state, in Kentucky, here's where the emerald ash borer is at the moment. Um, and I am sure that it will fill in these counties over time. But I think what we've seen, so it was first introduced in the northern Kentucky in 2009 and then spread pretty rapidly across the state. Um, so the, if we look at a map of ash distribution, 
which I'm sorry, I don't have in this presentation, but um, what you'd find is that there was a lot of ash in Northern Kentucky, a lot of white and green ash as well as blue ash. Um, and there are little pockets of ash throughout here, but there's nowhere near as much um, ash in the Western part of the state, which is I think why it's been moving more slowly in this area. Um, it's, it's not that um, it won't get there eventually. It's just there was a lot of ash. So across the state, ash was about 4% of the trees, which if you think about the devastating impact that the Emerald Ash Forest had, it's, it's surprising, I think, to think that ash was only 4% of the, the trees in the state. It feels like more. Um, and it certainly feels like more if you're in one of these areas that had 25, 30, 35% ash. Um, you know, that's a huge loss. Um, and I think kind of thinking about the Emerald Ash Borne and thinking about uh, where to go from there really depends on where you're located. Are you in an area where all of the trees have died or are you know well underway or is it something that's just arrived to your area? Because if you're in an area where all of the trees have died um, and you're trying to think about you know what what comes next, uh, you really want to set the stage for success post Emerald Ash Borne. And doing so depends on what you currently have. If you had only 4% of your trees were ash, um, then what you really want to do is just promote the, the natural processes that are occurring, the trees that are there and their success, because that's something that, that areas can deal with um, versus if you had 35% of of your tree is lost. You know, that's a huge loss. And probably what you're seeing now is lots of ash seedlings coming up. Um, unfortunately, those are not resistant. Those are going to be killed by the emerald ash borer once they get big enough, but they might be clogging things up and preventing the other species that you want to see in there. Now, the nice thing about emerald ash borer is that there, there is um, an insecticide treatment that you can use to protect individual trees. It does need to be repeated um, regularly to protect and prolong that protection. So it, to the best of our knowledge, that's going to have to happen indefinitely. We're not going to get to a point where um, trees no longer need to be treated, at least not anytime soon, but you might be able to prolong the time between those treatments, um, uh, insecticide treatments for trees, as the emerald ash borer populations go down. So they kind of were really high when there was a lot of ash trees, and now they're going to go down. But because we do have all of these ash seedlings around, they're going to continue to grow. Um, they're not they're not going to be completely gone. Um, uh, and I would also say that the Forest Service's Northern Research Station has a really exciting research program finding ash that um, have some degree of resistance or tolerance to the emerald ash borer. So trees that are either able to better defend themselves against the emerald ash borer are less attractive to the emerald ash borer. And they've done some really exciting research finding some of those. I mean, a very painfully few number of them, but some of them um, that I think long-term will also be part of the, the, um, the package of how do we uh, bring ash back into our landscapes is, um, genetic resistance and those individual trees, finding those trees that can defend themselves, um, protecting trees with insecticide. Um, and then uh, there's there's also, and typically with these tree restoration breeding programs, there's also the, um, the other aspect of biological control. So um, are there insects and diseases that might be able to kill the emerald ash borer? And I mentioned hemlock woolly adelgid earlier, and that's one where there's also a lot of active um, release of potential biological control predatory insects to eat those hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, is it going to be effective in our area uh, long term? I think uh, is still to be determined uh, because you've got to deal with the whole life cycle of those insects as well. Um, but another exciting long term. Um, hopefully strategy that'll help us deal with some of these. So Ellen, I was going to let you know, we were a, oh gosh, probably back in early, early on 2010, 2011, 2012, we were a EAB parasitoid wasp release site up nice. here in Northern Kentucky. And um, I think we released everything that was available at the time. We worked with Joe Collins to do all of that. Um, we were protecting our trees that we had planted in our collections with uh, minocloprid, uh, 
Dino Tefuron, all of that. Mm -hmm. And economically, we just couldn't do that long term. So we started yeah. doing a plan to let some of them die out mm -hmm. and uh, replace when we could with other species. So we had an ash collection that was about 88 trees. Uh, a lot of it was centered in one area of the Arboretum and it really messed up that part of the Arboretum. Um, no. But we were in the process of replacing some stuff. We completely stopped treating our ash trees about five to six years ago and really quickly lost all of our green ash. None of our green ash had any chance at all, especially all the cultivars. Um, most of our wooded tr trees in the woods all died. We had a handful just a few trees that have not died yet. Um, so they're all kind of on the list of some of the radars, like you mentioned, the people that could check them out. Um, and then what's really been weird in the last two to three years, we noticed that some of our cultivar white ash, such as Rose Hill, they have completely stopped dying and they are ah. healing up and callousing all kinds of wood. Oh, like, that's exciting. Yeah, callousing on the branches. You can yeah. see these, these pockmarked, Areas mm -hmm. where they're doing wound callusing where they yeah. were infected with EEB. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it's our if it's our parasitoid wasp population kicking in to stop it. If the population crashed so severely here after everything died that there's just not much left to uh, kill them. I don't know really. So hopefully, That's exciting. Can, yeah, hopefully someone can come check out what's going on here and see what you know what the data might say. <laughs> and I from talking, so Jennifer Cook is the uh, lead researcher at um, the Forest Service who's doing a lot of that um, lingering ash work where it's, you know, trying to find those trees that are left and try to figure out, you know, is there something special about them that makes them still alive while everything else has died or are they just lucky? And I know that um, from some of her work, it seems like there's a, a bunch of different strategies, you know, a, a diversity of different ways that some trees are still alive while others have died. Some of them are less attractive to the emerald ash borer. Some are better able to do exactly what you're talking about in that they might be attacked by it, but then they can kind of respond better. They can seal off that, that, um, that beetle damage um, better. And so that's really exciting. It's exciting that you're seeing that. And I've also heard from a lot of people that their blue ash are doing that and they're doing, they're still surviving and they might have some damage, but it's, you know, they're still surviving around, which is also really exciting to me. Um, because if you think about things like um, chestnut blight, you know, chestnut blight, we don't, we don't really see that, unfortunately. American chestnut uh, is, is, there's not, there are some individual trees that are left, but if you inoculate them, they still get sick and die um, or their offspring. You know, it's not that inherited resistance that you want to be seeing long term. Um, so it's really been limiting in terms of options for bringing it back. And I think it's part of why the approach of um, genetically engineering chestnut is, is, um, is the direction they've gone in because they don't have a lot of that native um, resistance happening. So thinking about that with ash, you know, it just opens a whole new possibility that that's going on. So yeah, I'm excited to hear that and I want to go see your trees now. Definitely, <laughs> anytime. Uh, let's see, our planned community planted ash, white pine and pear trees, all fast growers. Oh, I know it. I know. Doesn't that stink? I mean, you're, you're, Ash died with emerald ash borer. Your white pine is dying because white pines are really struggling. Um, pines in general are struggling um, and just not the best adapted to our climate. Our soils are, are um, uh, uh, challenging in increasingly wet conditions. Um, suggestions for replacements? Yes. Yes, so let's let's all hive mind this and think together and think of some some ideas for Carol who chatted this question. What should her neighborhood plan now? And my my advice it goes again back to something that I said. I've, I'm I'm a broken record with this, but I, I've got my little soapbox. I'm gonna stand on it. Is that instead of just planting three species, you should plant a lot of different species. You should plant great diversity. And I know that um, it doesn't. It, we have this um, uniformity that is aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you know, people want to plant the same species in a row. Um, but anytime you're doing that, you're kind of setting yourself up for problems because invariably there's going to be some invasive insect that comes in and takes them out or even some native insect um, if you've got the exact same species planted in a row. 
Um, and I think diversity, plant diversity, plant a variety of different trees that do what you want. You know, is what you want tall shade trees? Oh, plant oaks, but don't just plant pin oaks, plant different oaks, plant all sorts of different species. We've got, so we have, you know, 120 different native trees in Kentucky. Um, uh, dive into some of that diversity, but also species that are going to thrive in your area. So if you have drainage issues, um, you know, planting species that are going to deal well with that, and it's not going to set them up for, for problems in the future. You, um, I see a chat, um, oaks, birch, maple, sycamore, hickory, um, yes, and <laughs> many others. So Kentucky coffee tree, um, you could plant uh, black gums, you could plant bald cypress, you could plant, you know, just we are scratching the surface. There are so many different ones and they might be harder to find. Um, so if you're planting a lot, they might be harder to source than some of the other ones. But I really encourage you to dig into this diversity that is our native um, species. Uh, that, that, that people typically don't don't use. And right now what I'm seeing is that um, the elm died and we plant an ash. The ash died and we're planting red maple. And then we have Asian longhorn beetle right on our doorstep that could take out all of our red maple as well. Um, so instead of just planting one species, planting this diversity and, and you know, for your tall trees, yes, all of those and then more. And then um, for your, if you want flowering trees, cause you've got those pears in there, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great flower uh, trees um, that you could use as well if you want really small ones, your service bear, your dogwood, your redbud, your um, uh, uh, yellow woods, your aronias, your emu, we, we, there's so many. <laughs> so, so to have fun and experiment and use a diversity of different species would be my yep. advice. And Chris, do you have more? Yeah, Ellen, we uh, recently planted out some new stuff in our former ash collection in yeah. Emerald City, Tulip tree was one that we bought from oh, a local that, yeah. Hammond nursery. Yeah, so it's a nice cultivar that's really become available. It's a very refined, even growing, deep green leafed uh, variety of tulip tree. And of course, you could plant normal tulip trees as well. So that's one we stuck in too. So we want a nice, large shade providing tree that could be really a nice anchor. And guess what? It's our state tree. Yeah. Also the state tree of Indiana and Tennessee. So, so you're good uh, no matter where you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love tulip tree. It's one of my favorites. And it does, you know, sometimes um, it does this thing when it gets stressed, it drops all of its leaves. So like if you have a drought, it's just going to drop its leaves in the summer. And sometimes it might drop its leaves several times. Um, but uh, I think it's kind of a, I mean, it, it's a nice adaption to kind of like the environmental characteristics and then it'll, it'll put a new flush out. Um, and so I know sometimes it's, People don't like that landscaping, but I love it. And I love its beautiful flowers. I think the flowers are, are gorgeous. Um, and I just love its oh, that, stately form. Uh, beautiful. We call that a drought indicator tree. So it's yes. telling you you need to water the rest of the garden because it's dry and it's not happy. So yeah. that's just and if water your, me. If your oak <laughs> dropped its leaves three times in the summer, it'd be in trouble. But your your um, tulip poplar can deal with that just fine. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, the best place to go get some ideas is visit the Arboretum. Walk around, look at the species, look at something that you've, you know, something new, something that's thriving there and get some ideas for things that you could plant. Definitely. And the good news is that we live in a climate in an area that can grow lots of tree species. So we have ample rainfall. Mm -hmm. Like you said, sometimes too much. You know, <laughs> we may curse the heavy clay soil that we have, but the good news is there are lots of choices that we can mm -hmm. grow really well. Uh, yeah. And it, diversity is the key. It really is. Just picking lots of different things, mixing it up, not, not just doing one thing again, because that's the recipe for failure every time. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, it's fun. It's fun to like explore the diversity that's present. Um, I would say that since one of them is a pine, we should talk about evergreens and the challenge of finding good evergreens in, in our area. And so Chris can, can chime in on this. There are some, there are some that, that perform well in our area, but a lot of evergreens, um, we don't have very many native evergreens, um, which should tell us something. It should tell us that it's hard. It, you know, something about our location, our site, our climate is challenging. We have holly, we have eastern red cedar, and there are many cultivars of that that are available that are great for different uses. Um, different hollies, we have, you 
you know, evergreen hollies and we have deciduous hollies and there's inkberry as well for it's smaller, um, but there's not a ton of them. Um, so then we start dipping into the non-natives. Um, there is a challenge because many of them perform very poorly in our area. People love the Colorado blue spruce. Um, it is a recipe for, for fungal disease and death. <laughs> you can have a temporary Colorado blue spruce. And if you get lucky, if you've got the right site, you can have a beautiful one. I mean, there, there are people do, and, and not to say that you can't, but especially if you want something that's low maintenance and your site is not extremely conducive to it, you'd be much better served with some different options. I pushed uh, Eastern Red Cedar quite a bit. Um, in the northern part of the state, that's the primary native evergreen that you see. Uh, people hate to hear that sometimes, but they really are tough. They do well. Um, and there are cultivars out that are coming out. If you're looking for a narrow screen tree, there's uh, one called Green Point, which was found in Western Kentucky. So it's got good Kentucky genetics. It's adapted well to Western Kentucky. It's a very narrow, upright form that can do wonderful for a screen. Uh, there's an older one called Taylor that came out of Nebraska. It's kind of a blue-green variety, also very tight and narrow. It gets three foot wide and you know, 30 foot tall. So Easter Red Cedar is out there, and it's becoming more available in the uh, nursery trade, uh, more easy to obtain. Not easy to really dig up and transplant from uh, like the field or on the edge of the woods. So they don't like being transplanted that much if they've already been out in the wild, but they are being produced in uh, nurseries now. So that's a good one. Yeah, that's always a challenge. The the privacy screen, uh, you know, our natives just they they like being deciduous. We have, <laughs> we have a great diversity of deciduous natives, but not as many evergreens. So great to see those cultivars of eastern red cedar. Yeah, and then you can always do a mixed planting for a screen. So you could mm -hmm. have your red cedar mixed in with red buds, the service mm -hmm. berries. Do a layered planting. Uh, have some deciduous trees in there. That's you know. A lot of the time in the wintertime, we're not really outside on our patio much anyway. We don't want to be out there when it's not, you know, sunny and warm. So uh, having that deciduous mix with some evergreens is fine, too, for a screen uh, for when you really want it to be leafed out in the summertime. So we have a question. I have a volunteer red cedar coming up in my garden. Should I leave it or let it grow? And that's entirely up to you. Uh, there's, there's not, there's not an answer. Is it? I, some of my questions would be, um, you know, think about how red cedar grows and where this is seedling is coming up. Is it where you want it? And is it going to, is its eventual size going to be what you want there? Or did you want to be, um, and if so, I mean, there's nothing, uh, getting something that's, that's already growing there, that root system is going to be intact and growing well, and it's probably going to grow a lot better than something you transplant in there. Um, but it might not be what you're looking for. So it just depends. Um, Chris, did you have some other comments on that? And how much space do you have where it's sprouted at? Because they if it's get next to your house, they can get pretty big. Unless you have one of those skinny ones I talked about. But Yeah, and that's not going to happen naturally. <laughs> not likely, no. It's probably going to be a full-size tree. So it might, might eat up your house or your fence, depending on where it's at. Or it might crowd out something that you want, like your hydrangea or something next to it. <laughs> and maybe with some very aggressive pruning. Um, you can you can keep it where you want it, but um, yeah, you know, sometimes. A, hmm? I was gonna say if it's a couple feet tall, um, you know, under two or three feet, you probably could move it, but you have to take a, take care of keeping a lot of the root system. I, I know our students here, our interns, move red cedars a lot out of our landscape beds, and sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. Well, it looks like there's no other questions, but I just wanted to, uh, oh, for screening, we put up trellis and planted Dutchman's pipe. Oh, that's a nice, uh, another idea, nice. um, is trellising and putting up some of our, our native vines. Um, I think that the flower on uh, the native honeysuckle is the most beautiful of, of any of those vines. I love that one. We also have the, uh, the native uh, cross vine. Magnolia, mm -hmm. those are nice too. Mm -hmm. And they're semi evergreen. Native clematis species would work great. We just saw Anna few clematis on the, on the <laughs> chat. You're thinking alike. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming in today. And thank you to Ellen once again for 
uh, being willing to host this program with us. It was fantastic. Oh, we had, I know we had one comment. It was the best, one of the best Zooms that they have attended the entire past oh, year. Oh my goodness. That's high praise, especially after this last year. Um, uh, you know, I know that it, this is not the same as doing it in person, right? We're all getting zoomed out, but I kind of love it in that I can come and talk with all of you and, um, you know, it's just easy to connect with people all over. Um, so I appreciate it. We did have one question about the best place to buy native plants, and um, I'm going to put a link into the chat for the Kentucky Native Plant Society page. They have a nice um, collection of native plant uh, nurseries and nurseries that sell native plants that all pop in there. Um, but uh, there are lots of places to buy native plants. Um, they're, you know, your local independent retailer. I really encourage you to go to them and tell them that you're interested in native plants and talk with them about native plants. <laughs> um, but you'll find non-natives there as well. And you might even find some invasive species. Um, uh, you know, uh, the same is true with some of the big box stores. Sometimes they'll have great selections of natives. Um, sometimes they'll be mislabeled and they're actually non-natives and that's happened to me before. Um, and they'll have a lot of uh, stuff that, you know, um, you want to avoid. Um, I, if you're planning a large number of trees, I encourage you to check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry's nursery. Um, they, they, you know, buy sell um, large numbers of trees for things like tree plantings, and they use local native um, seeds for that. Let me put this link in the chat too. And I see some other folks are commenting. Yes, comment that your favorite um, nursery that sells um, native plants. Um, the link that I'm putting in is for the Kentucky Native Plant Society, um, their list of native plant nurseries, but it's not at all comprehensive. It's kind of just, just um, a starting place and um, places that their members have found native plants at. Any other tips, Chris? I think we're good. I was going to say Springhouse Gardens in the south side of Lexington is one that's got a native plant section, mm -hmm. not a nursery that's just for native plants. So they at least have a section. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more places are starting to do that. They're doing a native only section uh, because they, the demand is increasing. Yeah. And I love that. And I think um, one of the questions that comes up a lot in Kentucky is, you know, it's not legal to sell some of these in other states. I'm like, why can you sell these in Kentucky when, when other states have, have decided to not? do that. And I think that that's kind of a, a political question. Uh, you know, some states have decided that you, you can't sell Bradford pear or um, burning bush or others. Um, and that's something that happens state by state on what the people want. Um, but what the real reason that, that places sell invasive plants is that people buy them. <laughs> no one would sell these species if people did not buy them. Um, and they do grow well and they do establish rapidly. Um, so it's all about people recognizing them and people demanding those native species. Because if those sold, then that's what they would carry. <laughs> But it's hard because it is circular, because if you don't know that something's there, you don't know that it's available, it, it isn't available and you can't buy it. So the more demand we can create for these natives, the better, in my opinion. Yeah, and Klein Nursery up in Northeast Ohio was a perfect example. They grew hundreds and hundreds of Carolina buckthorn. So that's the native one. That's our native Carolina buckthorn. They grew hundreds of those and did not sell a single one because everyone thought that there was only invasive buckthorns. Oh, and, and I love the Carolina amazing. buckthorn. Oh, I know, it's, it's a great tree. <laughs> it's one of my new favorites in, in landscaping. And it's, it's I've I found it to be semi-evergreen. I don't know about you, yeah, um, but oh, it just grows really well. It's, um, I, I think it's very nice. But yeah, you don't want to confuse it for a different buckthorn. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, the, the lack of awareness mm -hmm. pretty much meant that no one bought the native plant that he was trying, that they were trying to pr produce and promote. And he's, you know, unfortunately said, I'm not going to grow that again because yeah. I couldn't sell any of it. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to create that demand to get the nurseries to, to start growing what we want. So. so what you're saying is that everybody who's watching now is officially a native plant ambassador and they have to go and, uh, you know, tell somebody about a cool native plant that they should use. <laughs> yes. yes. 
yeah. go go since this is earth day this is the week of earth day go yes. to your local independent real retailer and get some great natives definitely and we will be putting this on our youtube channel probably so this will be up for others to see from from now on so uh if you watch this in the future please do all the things we just mentioned <laughs> Yeah, it's Earth Day every day. So, you know, it's it's never a bad time to to try to support your native plants. Well, thanks again. I think we're gonna go ahead and call it a a day, at least a for this talk. <laughs> so everyone have a good rest of your day and a good week. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.